Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, interesting video today. We're going to react to difficult reality of Muslims in Germany, a lecture by Sheikh Dr. Yasser Kadi. So for people that have been following my channel, you already know I am from the Balkan. However, I grew up in Germany. I reverted to Islam. And therefore, of course, I have a very specific view when it comes down to Islam in Germany. Guys, before we jump into the video, as always, if you enjoy my content, leave me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And check out the links in the description box below to further support. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. Today's lecture will be, inshallah, informative and useful. I have just returned from a tour to Germany. First time I was visiting Germany as a tour. And so I wanted to explain to you the reality of Islam and Muslims in Germany. As you know, I do these types of series. We talked about Islam in Nordic countries, Islam in Australia, Islam in multiple places. The purpose is so that we broaden our horizons and benefit from their experiences, they benefit from us. We realize the problems and the positives and the negatives and we feel a connection with our ummah across the globe. So a brief summary of uh, this uh, journey that I had and also the reality of Islam in Germany. Germany, out of all of the uh, superpowers of the 18th, 19th century, actually has a unique history. It was the only major superpower that did not colonize a Muslim land. Italy colonized a Muslim True. land. France colonized. England colonized. Germany did not colonize any Muslim land. In fact, Germany, generally speaking, was far more sympathetic to Islam and Muslims in the 17th, 18th, 19th century than the other superpowers. In fact, 100%. they were the ones who invented the term the Orient in order to kind of romanticize the Orient, meaning us Muslims, and to put us on a pedestal. Their most famous intellectual philosopher of the 17th century, Goethe, he actually has a book, Goethe. if you know your uh, Persian history, the Divan of Hafiz, right? So Goethe, who is the most famous German poet philosopher, wrote a book similar to the Divan of Hafiz, and he called it the East-West Divan. And in it, he praised Islam, and he mentioned that Islam out of all of the religions is the most global religion. So in the 17th century, one of the most greatest minds from this region is actually praising Islam when England and other countries had nothing but disdain for Islam. So from the beginning, generally speaking, the German mindset was more sympathetic to Islam and the Ottoman Empire. And this is actually demonstrated even in political ties. Yes, up until now, everything he said is absolutely correct. And this is why when I lived in Germany, I really wondered why so many foreigners from Muslim countries hate Germany. There was a lot of hatred directed towards Germany and I never understood why because as he said Germany never colonized Muslim lands and therefore those Muslims living in Germany didn't live in the land of the enemy. Quite the opposite, they got refuge in a land that offered them safety and economic prosperity. So in the 19th century, uh, the Ottoman Empire actually established ties with Germany and the German Kaiser, yes. uh, the Emperor Wilhelm II, actually Built visited mosques. Istanbul. So the German Emperor Wilhelm II visited Istanbul 1898 and he met with Sultan Abdul Hamid. There's a famous place in Istanbul if you go there, they constructed an entire mini, uh, if you like, podium, which is still there, one of the iconic sites that you will find. So, the, And there's video footage of the emperor coming because it's 1898, so black and white video footage. And he gave a lecture in which he said, Germany will remain an ally to the 300 million Muslims. Back then, Muslims were 300 million. He literally said, Germany will be your ally. These other superpowers, forget about them. We will be your helpers. And he established a strong tie with the Ottoman Sultan and Empire. And that is why German scholarship about Islam was always radically different than English scholarship. Perhaps some of you don't know this, uh, but even when I went to do my, my PhD, I realized this very early on. The bulk of writings in the 17th, 18th, 19th century about Islam that are even a little bit positive, relatively speaking, are in the German language. And the English language did not have even anything equivalent. And the German uh, uh, Orientalists, back then they would be called Orientalists, were far ahead of their British equivalent. German scholarship on Islam left a mark in the Western Academy that we still feel to this day. On a personal note, when I was doing my PhD at Yale, both of my professors were German. 
The, as you know, the Ivy Leagues hire the best professors. Both of my Islamic studies professors have studied in Germany, PhD in Germany, and they're brought to America because that level of scholarship, it is difficult to find over here. And they are accomplished scholars in their own fields. So German scholarship about Islamic studies has always been light years ahead. This isn't uh, before the modern times. Now things have changed. But we're talking about until the 1950s. And in fact, when Nazi Germany yeah, came into power, exactly many right. scholars of Islamic studies fled to Ottoman lands. And they took refuge in Ottoman lands. And some of them trained a new generation of Muslim scholars because they were now based in Istanbul and other uh, regions. Yeah, he mentioned Nazi Germany there briefly. However, he did not mention that Hitler himself was very sympathetic towards Islam. Even the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin el Husseini, visited Nazi Germany during World War II. He directly met with Adolf Hitler in 1941 and they discussed colonial rule and Zionist efforts in Palestine. The sympathy for Islam went even so far that you could see German soldiers actually pray with the Muslims, pray like Muslims. And as always, I have to, of course, censor myself here on YouTube. But just think for yourself, it's quite interesting, of course, that until the time of the Second World War, you see a strong sympathy, a strong support for Islam within Germany. And after the Germans were defeated, all of a sudden you see this strong decline or rather this strong opposition towards Islam, even a hatred towards Islam in the West truly makes you think, who won that war? So, Germany therefore has always had a slightly different relationship back in the past. And this is also demonstrated in yep. their converts. A number of famous people from Germany converted to Islam. Of them, uh, somebody by the name of Hugo Marcus. This is in World War II. You probably don't know his name. Maybe one day I'll give you a whole talk about him. Hugo Marcus, he converted and he went to the Ottoman side and he fought against his own uh, people. He became an ally with the Muslim Ummah and he called himself Suleiman Al Franconi from Frank. Suleiman Al Franconi is a famous story about him. Maybe one day we'll mention that. But all of you know one convert from Germany. He has left a mark on the world a hundred years ago, and that is Leopold Weiss, Muhammad Assad. Muhammad Assad, the famous person, uh, all Pakistani should know him. He was the first foreign minister, the first foreign minister of Pakistan, Muhammad Assad, because he took Pakistani citizenship. Believe it or not, right? The German convert, he was born in the German lands, spoke German as his mother tongue. Of course, he's Austrian, Polish, German. You know, back then it's all one, but he's German. He's German. And he traveled in Arabia. German. He interacted with King Abdul Aziz, right? He, at the time, was a non-Muslim. He became very well known in Arabia. He converted to Islam in Arabia. He married a lady from Mecca. He married a lady from Mecca in Arabia. His son, his son is a very famous professor in New York, Talal Asad. So Talal Asad is a famous anthropologist, one of the most famous in the world. His mother is a Makkawi, Makki, yani Saudi, and his father is a Jewish convert because Muhammad Asad was a Jewish convert. One of the most interesting cases. Maybe one day we'll talk about Talal Asad. That's another case. Muhammad Asad then migrated to Pakistan. He took on Pakistani citizenship. He died in Pakistan. There are interviews that he has from Pakistan because he died in 1981, 82. So there's interviews of Muhammad Asad, uh, again, a German convert to Islam. So Germany has always had a very different relationship in this regard. As for German immigration, the Muslims migrating to Germany, this too has a very unique history. After World War II, when Germany, of course, is completely demolished, when they're uh, their male population is dwindling, so they open up a program. They call it guest workers, in the German term, guest workers. They want people to migrate. Gast and Arbeiter. because they have close ties with Turkish Ottomans, they actually open the door for the Turks to come to Germany. This is a historic connection that they yeah. now open up the door. And Including so, 1961. Of many other countries as well. Yeah, this is the generation of my grandfather and of my parents. They went over to Germany as well as so-called Gastarbeiter, guest workers. 
and during that time, as I said correctly, many Turks came over, but many people from that Balkan region and beyond, for example, Yugoslavia used to be one country, this is how my parents migrated to Germany nowadays, they call it Northern Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, and whatnot. But even beyond that, you had Italian Gastarbeiter, you had Spanish Gastarbeiter, and whatnot. It was a time of prosperity, and during that time, yes, it is true, Germany was seeking work from the outside. However, the name already exposes, of course, what the true intent behind the Gastarbeiter really was. The guest worker was supposed to be a guest. Worker comes over, works, builds up Germany, and then ultimately leaves again. That was the initial idea behind the guest worker. But then over time, guest workers started creating children like myself, and they decided to stay in Germany. And therefore, they were not guests any longer. They want Turkish people to come and work because they need workers. They don't have workers. Factories don't have men. They needed people to run the business. They need people. So perhaps a million people came. That is a massive number. Sure. A million. Those one million, their descendants are now five million or something, six million. Like massive amounts. This is in the 60s. So in the 60s, Germany opened the door for Turkish Muslims to come. And because of this, as we're going to come to, large groups of Turkish Muslims came. And now their third generations are in Turkey, are in, are in Germany now. Not their children, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Because this yes. is a migration before America. American migration, you know, took place primarily 80s, some 70s, very few 60s. 80s and 90s is the main migration. In Germany, the migration is one and a half generation Even before. before that. So when I went there, the majority of the Turkish Germans that I met, their grandfathers had come. Their fathers and mothers were born in Germany. Their grandfathers had come from uh, Turkey to Germany. So this is the largest Absolutely. group of uh, uh, migrants that have come, and we're going to come back uh, to them. Along with this, in the last 20 or 30 years, Germany has also opened the, uh, the door for migration from other lands, and especially from war-torn lands. And so Afghanistan and Syria, yep. perhaps a million each. Massive quant, the largest this group of migration from Afghanistan heavily. to any Western country has taken place in Germany. And the largest group of migration from Syria to any Western country has been Germany. And this is recent, yes. i.e. the last 20 years, right? Since the war of the last 25 years, and especially Syria, the last 10 years. So Unfortunately. Yeah, so I talked about this briefly, and I know people in the comments will get upset, but genuinely, I really don't care. Because my stance is very, very simple. During the time of the Gastarbeiter, the guest workers, there was a true need for workers from outside of the country. This does not apply to refugees from Syria or from Afghanistan, for example. Moreover, the term refugee doesn't always apply to those people either, because we're not talking about women and children, but in most instances, we're talking about men from 20 to 40 year old. You can find countless of videos online, interviews with so-called refugees, they're all men, and when they get interviewed, they tell you themselves that they're planning on getting the kids and wives over to Germany. This does make sense. This doesn't define a refugee. If there were truly refugees, of course, you would send the women and children first. The men would stay back and fight. Moreover, Islamically speaking, we know as well that a Muslim is not supposed to leave the battlefield. It is absolutely haram, actually. And therefore, it, of course, makes you wonder why Muslim men would leave Muslim countries that are at war. Now have massive populations of these lands. You have smaller uh, pockets as well. And that is, uh, uh, you have also North Africans, Moroccans, you have Bosnians, you have uh, Pakistani Indians. We go everywhere, mashallah. But not like here. We're not, our percentages are nowhere there. In the whole audience there, there were probably less than 5% of uh, our ethnic background, right? So I did miss not having enough biryani when I go over there. Generally, I always make sure I have some biryani. So the Pakistani said, next time you come, we'll take you to our restaurants because there are not as many as the other uh, groups over there. Currently, how many Muslims in Germany? Unbelievable, unbelievable. It is estimated that up to 8% of the country is Muslim. 8%. And yeah, this 8%, sure. as is At always least. the case, you cannot say 8% for the whole country. 
cities, the bigger cities will have what? More or less? Way more. More population. Way more. I was completely more blown away. Of course. Hamburg and yeah. Berlin, more than 10% Muslim. At least. When I was driving down Hamburg, my host said to me, in this one street that we're driving, there are over 50 musallas. 50 in this few miles. Sure. One yeah. street, one main street. 50 areas to pray. I said, no, no, you got to be 15. No, 50, he said. Frankfurt, which is the hub of international <laughs> trade, you will yeah. be completely <laughs> blown away. The hub of international drug trade. You will be completely blown away. It is estimated 15% of Frankfurt is Muslim. Unbelievable. Sure. Again, statistics are... And you see this because everywhere you go, everywhere you go... Yeah. I wish I could be as enthusiastic as he is because on paper it sounds great. Hey, 15% in Frankfurt are Muslim. That is absolutely amazing. That is absolutely beautiful. Here in Thailand, there is a humongous Muslim population as well, and it is rising. For people that don't know, I live in Thailand currently, and depending on where you are, the further south you go, the more Muslim it is. And I can most definitely say that this is extremely positive and absolutely amazing to live here, because those Muslims are not only integrated in Thai society, but those Muslims are truly good people. However, in the case of Frankfurt, especially if you look into Frankfurt, it is called zombie land or crackford because they have a drug epidemic. And in most instances, the dealers are actually foreigners. Moreover, if you look into violent crimes in Frankfurt alone, you had 25,000 cases of violent crimes. 40% of those cases were actual foreigners. And with foreigners, we're speaking about non-German passport holders. But as he described already, now we are in the third generation of foreigners in Germany. And therefore, they have German passports. I do have a German passport as well, but that doesn't make me German. I always find it so funny. People don't seem to understand this whatsoever. Even Germans would call me German sometimes. They would say, yeah, well, of course, you grew up in Germany. You speak German. You are German. And I would say, no, man. If my parents were astronauts and they would travel to Mars and I was born on Mars, I'm not a Martian. I will always stay ethnically someone from the Balkans that grew up in Germany. That's just what it is. So therefore, living somewhere, being born somewhere doesn't magically make you that ethnicity. And especially not if you just hold the passport. It doesn't mean anything. Nevertheless, even in this instance, even if we take this statistic, 40% of those 25,000 violent crimes were committed by people with no German passport. And then the other 60%, you do the math, of course, if they were all ethnically German, if you look at the population and the density of those Gastarbeiters and their families. So therefore, looking at Germany, when I hear Muslims and, hey, it's 10% Muslim, you would like to think that it is something positive, but unfortunately, in many, many instances, those people are very prone to criminal activity in Germany. There are literally like corner stores that are selling halal products, selling stuff from the Middle East. Corner sure, stores that, that are great. Afghani in origin or Syrian or Iraqi, shawarma places everywhere. And you know, all the different cuisines and all the different people. Moderna. Everywhere you go in the major cities, you find the presence of Islam very, very clear, very palpable. However... Obviously, as with all, there's positives and negatives in each okay. one. And the fact of the matter is that it was eye-opening for me to hear from the German Muslims the reality of life in Germany. There is a sentiment of fear. There is a climate of intimidation right now. Alhamdulillah, I was allowed to go preach there. There are many preachers that are banned for the most trivial reasons, number one. Number two... Me, myself, uh, and you know my track. Listen, man, I'm the first one that will call out media propaganda. We all know who runs the media. But ultimately, in Germany, especially during the war in Syria, we had a lot of issues. We had a lot of so-called jihadi mosques. There were a lot of mosques that recruited for ISIS. During that time, I saw it firsthand. The cousin of a very good friend of mine got recruited by ISIS. He went to Syria and got killed. This is something that I experienced 
way back before I left Germany. And this is why I had a not necessarily fearful opinion of Islam, but a negative opinion of Islam back then as well, because it was a reality in Germany. So therefore, him now saying, oh, well, for the most trivial reasons, yeah, now they might appear trivial, but during that time, we had a real issue with masjids recruiting for Syria. Moreover, as I said, a lot of the violent crimes come from foreigners of Muslim countries and therefore they have a specific image of Islam and you cannot blame them about it. What you should do is, of course, enforce a positive image of Islam in Germany so Islam can grow naturally and organically. Record, I'm not involved in anything radical or whatnot. It wasn't about me. We couldn't rent a single university campus or a public hall for my talks. I said, why? Is there any issue with me? No. Everybody is scared to rent to Muslims. The non-Muslims, they don't want to be involved with the Muslim population. Despite the fact we're 15%. But they don't want anything to do with Not having despite, anything Islamic, anything because. public to do with Islam. Why is this the case? Let us now deconstruct. And I say this with love and respect to my brothers and sisters in Germany. The goal is to benefit. There's no criticism here. We're all in this together. We want to help each other out. We want to make sure that we learn from you, you learn from us. The biggest impediment that I have seen, 60% of the Muslims are of Turkish origin. And the Turkish masajid are run directly from the government in Turkey. Yep. In Turkish. The construction, the imams, the climate, the yep. khutbas. It is as if you're in Turkey. Exactly and right. And that community, 60%, is disconnected from the rest of the Muslim groups. 100%. They have their own. So in the very audience that I came from, Exactly right. It's very nationalistic. Many Turks are extremely nationalistic. And therefore, they're excluding and alienating the rest of the ummah. But moreover, and I find this the most important aspect actually, they are alienating the Germans, the potential converts, the potential reverts to Islam. They're absolutely alienated because the khutbah itself is in Turkish. And therefore, looking at those mosques, a regular German won't see a house of worship, a house of God, where he could potentially find his way into. No, he will simply see a Turkish culture club, if you will. Two. A few token Turkish brothers that are involved outside of their groups. Otherwise, I am not going to be in that 60%. And because exactly. these massages are controlled literally by the Turkish government, literally, like there is a department, the Yanet Center, which yes, again, yes. it's great they're doing it. I'm not criticizing that. But what's going to happen when the government is going to be directly involved in the masajid? No politics. No khutbah. No nothing about you get the point like no political engagement just pray go back home pray read quran do dhikr go back home so 60 percent of the population of muslims they're completely disconnected from civic society in fact what is even more like i need to say this a bit bluntly with love and respect still that's that 60 percent many of them don't even want to take german citizenship they are not German citizens. There's a permanent green yeah. card category that this group has. And it's both ways. Aufenthalts Genehmigung. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And it is very memeable, of course. You find many memes of this on the internet of so-called Turkish nationalists, that the biggest Turkish nationalists are writing certain articles from Germany. And this is truly happening. So they're very proud of Turkey. They want to keep their Turkish passports. They don't want to become German citizens, but they want to live in Germany and then go to the mosques, which preach in Turkish. So therefore, they're not integrating into the society, nor are they interested in bringing Germans or other nationalities into the deen of Allah. No, they simply want to maintain their nationalistic allegiance in a foreign country and get the perks of that foreign land, but meanwhile still feel as if they are in Turkey. Members in the government as well don't want them to become citizens. And they themselves, Doesn't matter. They can't many do of them, about it if they are very to. happy because the version that they're being taught is their pride of their ancestry and whatnot. And so there is this limbo. Yep. You're neither here nor there because they're not living in Turkey permanently. They visit every few years. They speak the language fluently. Once per year, usually. This is, by the way, unique. I haven't seen any other country 
in Europe or in the Eastern Western world, the third generation is still speaking the language fluently. Only happened with them. Why? Because Not they're sure at all. Yeah, he has no idea about this, and I don't blame him because he hasn't lived in Germany, so therefore he wouldn't understand. This is not correct. The same applies to people from the Balkan, as I said, Italians, Spanish people, anybody in that surrounding truly, because those people go to holidays to visit back home once per year at least. So for example, my family, we come from Northern Macedonia, quote unquote, and we would visit at least once per year, twice per year, and stay in Macedonia for a reasonably long time, for six weeks, for example, sometimes for two months, depending on how many holidays my parents could get. And therefore, the connection is extremely close. And I now, as the third generation, ultimately, still speak fluently Macedonian. And I'm even teaching my son now Macedonian, even though we are living in Thailand. So there you go. It doesn't only apply to the Turks, not whatsoever. It applies to most European countries that migrated to Germany. However, me traveling to Australia or New Zealand, when I met the Balkan diaspora over there, they, of course, didn't really speak Serbian or Macedonian or whatnot. They knew a few words not everybody, but most of them, because they simply couldn't visit the Balkan as often as we could as immigrants in Europe. These are bubbles. Their communities are cut off from the rest of the society. So within exactly. their community, yes. 100% Turkish. Khutbas to this day, third generation yep. Turkish. The whole ambiance is Turkish, which is, I guess, fine culturally. But then what happens with that? You are not taught that you are German. You are not taught you should be a part of society, to do anything with society. It's literally, you come into the masjid, you are I fully agree. Islamic, you go outside, you forget about this reality. When you yes. have this mindset, then what's going to happen, right? So the groups that invited me were the other masajid, non because the government control, obviously, I cannot, I'm not from that land, so I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be in that system, right? So who invited me? The masajid that are from the more immigrant community, right? those who came from Arab lands and some Pakistanis here, they're like that. They're the ones who were active in doing these types of durus and halaqat. So the sure, main sure. issue is that automatically, that 15% we're talking about, more than half of them, they have nothing to do with politics, with the political system, with engagement in public, and they're simply living their lives. Another issue is that the large percentage, even of the other half, are absolute fresh immigrants. 10, 15 years ago. A million yeah, roughly 10 and a years half ago. or 2 million from Afghanistan and Syria in particular, yeah. these two countries. And they came when? 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, 2015. So do you think they're going to speak fluent German? Do you think they're going to get the top-notch jobs? So then they are fresh immigrants. They are being discriminated against. They don't understand the system, they have come from war-torn zones, and obviously they're living disconnected lives right now. But there's sure. open- But as I mentioned before, this is of course not unusual because the whole state is very inorganic. It doesn't make sense for Syrians to flee to Germany. As you said, they're not speaking the language, they're not European, so therefore they don't really look like the Germans, not even close. Somebody in close proximity, even an Italian, a northern Italian, could kind of blend into the German ethnic fabric. Somebody from Afghanistan, rather not. They look very different, they speak different, their traditions are different, and therefore, of course, they will have problems migrating to Germany. And this is why I said that Syrians, naturally, should, of course, migrate, if at all, to Turkey, for example. It's the next closest thing to their culture, to their ethnicity, etc. I spoke about this in previous videos. Just imagine a war breaks out in the Netherlands and now those Dutch people go to Syria. That doesn't make any sense, of course. Those Dutch people should, if at all, leave to Germany, Belgium potentially, somewhere where they will effortlessly blend in and become part of the culture quite quickly. It is much easier for a Dutch man to migrate to Germany than for a Dutch man to migrate to Syria. And now if you take it to a further extreme, imagine a mass migration of Dutch people into Syria. And now they're not only seeking jobs. No, now they want to change the fabric of Syria. Now they want to have Christian churches, Dutch pubs and cheese shops and what not. You see how absurd this example already sounds, but this is what they're trying to do with Europe. 
And this is why you have so much animosity and so much hatred because it is an inorganic state. This is not what would happen naturally, organically in this world. They don't understand the system. They have come from war-torn zones. And obviously, they're living disconnected lives right now. But there is hope in their children. Some of their own children, now they're in university, they're the ones coming to my lectures. So we have a person, his father came from Syria, another, his parents came from Afghanistan. The children of that batch, they are now, inshallah ta'ala, they're the ones, they were the main ones who are hosting me now, the children. But this leads me to point number three. And this is something us American Muslims don't understand. Generally speaking, and I say this with love, trying to be factual, I'm not trying to be dismissive. Generally speaking, European Muslims socioeconomically are at a different status than American Muslims. Why? Because where did the visas come from in Europe? Who was the visa given to in Europe? To the workers. And in America, who was the primary recipient of visas? Students and skilled workers. Students and skilled workers. The primary, we know this. We all know this, right? This makes a massive difference in mindset now it is. and in socioeconomic clout. And I cannot impress upon you the reality of this. Most Muslims in Germany are socioeconomically, not middle class, if you get my point. The majority of them. And this also reflects in education. The people that I told you were third generation, I was shocked. They are the first people to go to university in their line. But why is he shocked? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. If you look into the early immigrations to America, be it from Italy or Ireland especially, those were simple workers too. And then second, third generation, this is when they started picking up studies and whatnot. So obviously it would be the same in Europe there as well. I don't know why he's so shocked and surprised. Grandfather and grandmothers are workers. Their parents were social, were working menial yeah, jobs. Yeah, sure, duh. It's this generation now that they're just beginning to go to university. The culture of education yeah. is not the same as over here. You know, for most of us, our children cannot even think of stopping after high school. It's not even an option, right? Straight to university, it's not even an option. You have to understand that's not the case for most of Europe still. Is still not the case. And this has impact because your socioeconomic clout, your political clout is all going to come with education, with integration. So when the bulk of these 15% are not economically empowered, they're not even some of them speaking German fluently, what is going to happen? And there's not a culture of education. Rather, there's a culture of isolation, which leads me to another negative. And again, yeah. I say this... He's absolutely right on the points that he lists there. And of course, then we have to ask ourselves the question, why is it happening? Do you really believe that the politicians that allowed mass migration on that scale to Germany didn't know this? Do you really think they're such idiots that they have absolutely no idea? Hmm, what will happen if we migrate 2 million Syrians to Germany that don't speak the language and have a very, very different culture? And moreover, they have way bigger fertility rates than the Germans as well. On average, a German produces maybe one kid, 1.3, according to statistic. And Muslims, on the other hand, in Germany produce at least two children. Worldwide, on the other hand, 31% of all births come from Muslims. And therefore, yet again, of course, I cannot say what I want here on YouTube, so therefore you do the math. Do you really believe that the German politicians or politicians in Germany, let's phrase it that way, have absolutely no clue, are total idiots, and just don't understand what will happen when you import this type of demographic to Germany. Hmm. Again, I say this, O oh Muslims of America, we really have a lot of positives we should thank Allah for. When you're living in Europe, yep. when you're living in Germany, for example, America is a land of immigrants. True. We are all immigrants. And the diversity of languages, skin colors, ethnicities, it's something we use to our advantage. Europe is not a land of immigrants. Exactly. And when Muslims are the only immigrants, they have a different religion, 
and a different skin color only. and a different cultural identity, it is very easy for the dominant group because it's only one group and one culture and one skin color and one language, right? It's very easy for the dominant group to put you down, demonize you. Sure. We know this in this country that the people that are looked down upon, they're divided into different categories, right? I don't want to be too explicit. Some have to do with south of the border. Some have to do with the skin color. Some have to do with the immigration. Some, so the hatred of the dominant group yeah, is split Mexicans, amongst man. multiple people. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Right? The racism is split. Imagine in Europe, in Germany, in France, all of that racism against immigration, against the wrong skin color, against the wrong this, against all of that combined against us. That's the reality. Yeah. So the reality. Yeah, but this is very, very simple. When I look into the mirror, I don't see a German person. I see a person from the Balkan. When I go to the Balkan, I see people that look like me. When I go to Germany, the Germans, the ethnic Germans, don't look like me. So therefore, if they look a bit strangely at me, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised when Thai people look a bit strange at me because I'm a foreigner in Thailand and I don't scream racism. This is just human nature. You are the other. Absolutely understandable. So therefore, he said something correct here. In America, all are migrants. Of course, the founding fathers were predominantly British of British descent. But nevertheless, it is true that this is the new world, quote unquote. You could make the same argument about Canada, Australia and whatnot. Those countries are the new world and it is based upon migration. And therefore, you have different ethnicities and you have a common language that you use. However, this does not apply to Europe, as he mentioned already. Moreover, it does not apply to Africa either. It does not apply to India either. It does not apply to China either, right? This is how it is, man. Those countries are not created by mass migration. They have their ethnic makeup, and this is what made them into those countries. Italy is Italy because of their ethnic background and their culture. Macedonia is Macedonia because of their ethnic background and their culture. And the same applies to Germany as well. As I said already, you would never think that it is a good idea to take a bunch of Dutch people and to mass migrate to Syria. Matter of fact, you don't think it's a good idea because if you look into South Africa, this is what happened, right? A bunch of Dutch people colonized South Africa and established their new country. And to this very day, you have tensions of racism. And many people take the stance of the original Africans, of the black Africans, and say that those Dutch people should leave because they colonized that land. Right, So in that instance, you will call it colonization because white people did it. But if you have mass migration to Europe, which is a passive colonization, if you will, then all of a sudden it has to be accepted. It needs to be this way. No, it absolutely does not. I am here living in Thailand. I always give this example. And I don't expect Thailand to mold to my belief systems. I don't expect Thailand to become Northern Macedonia, to become the Balkan. If I wanted that, I should go back to the Balkan. No, I'm happy being in Thailand after all. And I want Thai people to preserve what it means to be Thai, ethnically, culturally, etc. The therefore, is that that 15%, that 10%, they're not equal to the rest of the 85-90%. They are yeah, living they like will second be. class citizens. Mm. Education, it's not in your face, but it's not as welcoming. Jobs, you not apply sure and the other person applies is they said not the sure same thing. This absolute nonsense. If we're speaking about the so-called refugees now from Syria that don't speak proper German, sure, da, go figure. Of course, it will be hard for them to get the same jobs as a German speaker. However, my generation, second, third generation immigrants. Man, if you paid attention in school, if you went through that Western educational system, you were just as easy to get a job like your German ethnic counterpart. Matter of fact, even easier nowadays because they have diversity hires and what not. So this is really an excuse. I heard it so many times. It annoys me from friends of mine that come from all kinds of countries 
that migrated to Germany and then they're complaining, they're looked at as the foreigner, etc., etc., you name it. The German people are actually quite welcoming and if you put in the work, you get a job just like anybody else. To me, like the name, the background, that hidden racism, right? That second-class citizenship, it is very clear over there. And therefore, this leads me to my next point, one of the most awkward points, but it needs to be said here. When you have a large group of disenfranchised young men and women cut off from the broader opportunities in public. They're right? not cut off, man. What do you think is going to happen to that group in terms of their understanding of Islam? Which strands and versions of Islam will appeal to them more? The mainstream ones or the more hardline ones? Again, we need to yeah, understand Germany human psychology. Predominantly right? Salafi, yeah. When you are persecuted even a little bit, you like ideologies that seem to give you extra power, make you more elitist, put, make you look down at everybody else. And so, True. not surprisingly, I don't want to mention too explicitly, very hardline groups yeah, are the popular amongst the youth, some of sure. which are banned by the government. And of course, when you ban the group, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Even more popular. When the government bans the group, right? There's a group that wants to call for Khilafah all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in Germany, you have a lot of Salafis. And of course, you have a lot of hatred against the Salafis because, as I said, you had many Salafi mosques that were recruiting for ISIS ultimately. And so, matter of fact, when you see so much hatred against Salafia, against this movement in Germany, then many young people assume, ah, therefore it must be right. Now we are truly the oppressed Muslims and we have to fight the Kufar. So therefore, it really gives you even more fuel for your movement. That is the most common group in that land. And they have protests with their faces covered, waving the flag that we want the Khilafah. What do you think is going to happen when the fellow German people see this reality? Sure, right? sure. Covering their faces and waving the flag and whatnot, and we want to establish the Khilafah and whatnot. I don't blame them because that's their education, that's their... But what is going to be the backlash? The backlash is, listen to this, one of the most popular political parties is a resurrection of the Nazi party. It's called the AFD. The it's AFD, not... Yes, it's a right-wing party, that is true, but the AFD is inherently Zionistic and therefore has nothing to do with the initial Nazis of Germany. None whatsoever. Are there racist, quote-unquote, elements within that group? Yes, of course. But they're simply right-wingers and what you would call conservatives nowadays. Conservatives, on the other hand, simply repeat what the liberals have said 20 to 30 years ago. It is nothing new. They're not true conservatives. They're not true right-wingers anywhere in this world nowadays. Ultimately, the right-wingers nowadays are simply liberals light. Is now winning more and more elections. It is likely within a few years, it will be one of the largest parties. And they sure. are a resurrection of Nazi party, but not. not against the other group, against us. And it's a two-way street because yeah, when that becomes not. more popular, the Muslims become even more some of them become even more radical. That feeds sure. into them, that feeds into their vicious loop. And this was very painful agree. to me. I asked them, how many politicians, you have 15%, how many politicians are representing Muslim interests? They said zero or maybe one out of all of us. I said, how is this possible? 15% and you don't even have a single person. And they told me a few months ago, in this debacle of, of what's happening in the Middle East, a few months ago, a Muslim was running for office. And I'm going to say this bluntly because it needs to be said here. We need to learn from this. Muslim was running, mashallah, votes coming, whatnot. They came to the masjid. They kind of, this group basically stood outside the masjid. Started protesting, giving flyers. It is haram to vote. This person's a kafir. He's running in a democratic election. <laughs> and yeah. so they're running and the police had to be called because yeah, they're causing a chaos never outside go the, anywhere. the masjid I was that's at. True. They told me this happened a few weeks ago that our Muslim candidate is running. We got the protest from the youth of our own community. You cannot run. It is kufr to run. It's haram to run. And we had to bring in the police because they're getting physical and whatnot. And then the media got involved. Now what do you think is going to happen when the media comes, right? So we have a lot of internal, and I say this, wallahi, not to, astaghfirullah, to 
make it worse amongst them, but to make us realize, to make us realize like how long are we going to have this debate? The people don't even view themselves as being a part of society. So what's going to happen then? Where are your rights going to go? And therefore, don't be surprised. In yep. multiple municipalities, there are clear Islamophobic politicians. In multiple areas, they have attempted to ban the hijab. They've attempted to... Here's another point. All right, guys. And this is it for today's video. I'm going to cut it off here. I think this was the longest reaction video that I've done in years. Matter of fact, he said many, many good things there. He really tried to be as laid back as possible, as politically correct as he could be. But ultimately, it really seems that he shares the same worldview as me, that you have many radicalized Muslims in Germany, that you have many non-practicing Muslims in Germany that give Islam a bad rep, that you have many nationalistic organizations such as the Turks in Germany building their Turkish mosques and whatnot, that you have a naturally occurring segregation now because you have two opposing opposing belief systems. And I'm not talking about Islam and Germany because Islam would be initially very compatible with Germany if it wasn't so tainted ultimately in the public eye due to many criminal activities and what not. And therefore, yeah, good job Yasser Kari. Of course, he has to be very cordial there. He's catering to his audience and cannot speak completely transparently. Neither can I here on YouTube. But I believe that she looks into the right direction and has absolutely the right perspective. All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace. <laughs> Oh